thank you for joining with us uh, this morning for a very, what proves to be a very interesting uh, webinar. Um, this is the next in the series of DERLAB webinars, and this one is uh, jointly with our colleagues in the Pantera and Eri Grid 2 projects. It's under the, the very stimulating title and very uh, pertinent title of Remote Testing and the Airy uh, platform. So I'm sure it will prove to be a very interesting time uh, together. My name is Graeme Burt. I'm from the University of Strathclyde and I'm one of the uh, members of the board of DERLAB. And I'm joined today in facilitating uh, this webinar by my colleague, uh, Mohammed. Mohammed, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself? Good morning, everyone. My name is Mohammed Chalabi from DERLAB, so I will be here also supporting Graham uh, with this webinar. Thank you very much. And um, if you can move on to the next slide, uh, Mohammed, you'll see, colleagues, um, the, the very interesting agenda we have. We'll, we'll start with a number of uh, presentations from, from Erigrid uh, 2, um, uh, led by uh, Thomas and uh, the team there, and then on to a um, uh, contribution from uh, the Pantera project and question and answer session. So um, I'm sure if you can stay with us for the full time, that would be great. And I'm sure you'll find it very valuable and very interesting in these times. Uh, I trust you and your families are all well. And uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join with us uh, today. And uh, please do make use of the interactive features that will be made uh, available. On the next slide, uh, Mohammed, um, colleagues, you will see um, a, a little introduction to DERLAB Network. The, the DERLAB Association is an association of distributed energy laboratories. We total over 30 uh, member institutes from across Europe and the US. Um, with uh, a range of universities and research organisations, national labs, um, all with a keen interest in the experimental proving of smart grid and DER integration uh, solutions. Um, we work together in this field. There are many uh, shared challenges and many shared opportunities, and the Dell Lab Association has successfully contributed to the advances that have been made with the integration of distributed energy resources and contributed to the decarbonisation of our grids. I was just sharing last week with colleagues from China that in Scotland we've now achieved 90%, that was in, at the end of 2019, 90% of our electrical energy demand is now supplied from renewable uh, sources. So significant progress has been made and, and that, that is, is uh, repeated across many of our, our states as well. And I'm pleased to say that through the Dell Lab Association, we've been contributing to that through rigorous testing and through experimentally and modern, validated modeling proven um, evaluation. Next slide, please, Mohammed. So the association itself is a member association which contributes networking um, services. Uh, such as the, the webinar the, the, this morning, but we also run quite regular internal only uh, webinars for Dell Lab members, which allows us to, to share best practice. And we also support a number of international uh, collaborations, such as ERA and uh, ETIP. Uh, we have a number of joint activities supporting each other on, on project consortia formation and knowledge transfer supporting a number of projects with dissemination um, and uh, some international collaboration. We have a number of information uh, resources available, some of which uh, are for, for members. But there's also a number of useful databases on the DER Lab website, so please do uh, look for those uh, in relation to our research infrastructures, as well as on standards and, and grid codes. Uh, very informative, so please do uh, make use of those, and also we support our members with visibility of their their capabilities, um, which is obviously a very important part uh, of our role. And the Dell Lab Association, we work with our members to uh, support each other in, in improving the take up uh, of our work and helping 
uh, stakeholders better understand the value that can be gleaned from experimental and validated model uh, 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 proving. Clearly, uh, with the with the current uh, restrictions, um, we we are uh, all facing challenges. But remote testing um, is is one way in which we are able uh, to mitigate some of those risks. So this this webinar is very pertinent. As I said at the beginning, we are keen to make this as interactive as possible. So, Mohammed, do you want to introduce colleagues to the facility for raising questions? Yes, I would like to introduce. So, we're going to collect today's uh, questions and answers through Slido. So, if you have your mobile phone, you could use uh, your mobile phone uh, to scan this QR code and you will. Uh, uh, Will be redirected to the Slido room, or if you would like to use your uh, your uh, um, browser, normal browser from your computer, also or from mobile or tablet, you could go to Slido, and you use the entry code for the room is Dialab. Uh, also, I will going to share in the chat the link so that you could directly you could go to the room, uh, and we are kindly asking you all the time to. Uh, ask questions so to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, as we are expecting to collect a lot of questions, and we have several speakers here in, um, in this webinar, I kind of ask you before before you uh, write your question to type this to whom you are addressing this question so that I could address it to the uh, right speaker. Uh, also, if you like a question or you feel that you have the same uh, idea about the question or you, you would like to promote this question, please give some up to the question. So by now, I, could, I would like to give the floor to Thomas. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you give me the presenter rights, please? Yep, are you arriving? So. I hope that you can see my slides now. Yes. Okay, perfect. Then let's start. So first of all, I would thank uh, Delap and Pantera and our IA platform very much for this uh, possibility to have this joint webinar together with the Irigrid uh, 2.0 um, research infrastructure project. So my name is Thomas Strasser. I'm from the Austin Institute of Technology, and it's my pleasure to uh, coordinate this uh, European uh, project which is a successor project of the Irigrid uh, 1 project, but I came to that uh, later on. During the next few minutes, I'll give you a brief overview about what we're doing in the project, um, what the project goals are, and then later on, uh, my colleagues from the project are getting deeper into details about uh, remote uh, services, remote testing, and uh, in general, also the lab access uh, program. So the motivation uh, that we had when we uh, uh, worked on the uh, proposal for Irigrid 2 was uh, we're facing uh, challenges in the planning and the operation of the energy infrastructure. It becomes more complex. I think all of us uh, know that very well. We have the uh, large-scale integration of renewables on the one hand side, so we uh, have challenges and changes on the generation side, but also on the uh, uh, consumer uh, load side. Uh, so, emerging uh, technologies like uh, battery storage systems, uh, electric vehicle, uh, the whole electric uh, transportation system, heat pumps. So we have more possibilities also to control uh, in some boundaries uh, the loads. Furthermore, we have to deal with uh, the digitalization of the infrastructure that's are uh, uh, emerging uh, trends. Uh, we have a deeper involvement of consumers and the market interaction compared to the past. And nowadays also we need, uh, or we are looking at sector coupling, so linking different energy vectors uh, together. Uh, the big question is always uh, how to design and validate such a smart energy systems for sure. We all know uh, we can go to the field and test our developments, but this uh, is uh, quite time consuming and uh, uh, also quite expensive. Uh, so in Irigrid 2, um, we are trying to work on uh, advanced validation and testing methods. First of all, before I go into the project goals in more detail, I want to give you a very brief overview about uh, the uh, long-term cooperation that we are having here in this uh, consortium and this uh, network. 
Uh, it's a pan-European uh, cooperation uh, with the roots uh, going uh, quite long back. Uh, it was maybe not the first project, but it was uh, somehow, uh, I would say, the kickoff of uh, this long-term cooperation uh, in this uh, setting with the DELAP uh, Network of Excellence uh, project, not to uh, it needs to be distinguished from the DELAP Association, which emerged out of this uh, Framework 6 uh, Network of Excellence program, which was uh, finalized uh, about um, uh, 10 years ago, uh, where 12 partners participated um, in this uh, network of excellence with a focus on DR uh, topics and uh, laboratory activities related to that uh, and pre-standardization. Then uh, after that, the uh, Dairy Research Infrastructure Project has been started. Uh, it was at FP7 Research Infrastructure uh, Project uh, with around 16 partners, also with a strong focus on uh, DR labs and pre-standardization. But here we had the first time the so-called transnational access. So that means uh, in this uh, funding scheme, we opened our laboratories for external people, uh, get uh, lots of uh, attention on DR topics, which has further been uh, um, Evolution or the evolution uh, to the uh, or extended to the uh, grid topics in Irrigrid One. That's a project that we finalized last year. Uh, we uh, also enlarged the uh, partners and the uh, uh, possibilities. So we had transnational access, so access to our laboratories and uh, validation possibilities, uh, not only focusing on DR uh, topics, but also on, on grid topics. And now in Irrigrid 2, we are enlarging this portfolio further with more partners, more countries, uh, but also uh, additional topics. So besides the DR topics, uh, grid uh, topics, on the, mainly on distribution uh, grids, um, we are also looking at smart energy systems, so the interaction of the electric power system with other energy vectors. Yeah, the key facts of Irigrid, uh, as you can see here on this slide, so we are 20 partners from 13 different countries. Uh, we are sharing uh, 21 uh, smart grid, smart energy systems and our laboratories. So uh, from these partners, you can check that out on our project website. Uh, HTTPS irrigrid2.tu. And besides that, besides this uh, uh, physical lab access, so the so-called uh, lab access, or uh, the uh, EC term is transnational access, uh, we are now sharing also virtual facilities. So that's a big uh, change, or in, uh, uh, I would say a, a natural extension also in this uh, pandemic uh, times. So that's a new uh, topic which we are going into, and my colleagues uh, will introduce that uh, in much more detail in the following minutes. So overall, the project duration is four and a half years. So we have started last year in April, and we will finish in 2024 uh, in September, the project. And uh, overall, we are getting around 10 million uh, funding from the European Commission for our activities. As I said, um, Irigrid 2 has a uh, big focus on smart energy systems research infrastructures. So we are uh, working on uh, linking uh, the electricity power grid also with other energy vectors like gas network, heat network, mainly uh, heat network, I would say in the, in the project is, is our main focus, but always with this uh, strong uh, uh, backbone uh, or the electric power grid is a strong back, uh, backbone. Um, yeah, and here we are trying to further develop and Im improve uh, um, advanced validation and uh, testing methodologies uh, based on simulation, cold simulation, and uh, laboratory uh, testing methods. Um, yeah. So the uh, the goal here is to take the results that we have uh, gained uh, or achieved in the Irrigrid One project. That was on the one hand side our we call the holistic validation approach, a structured approach for um, developing test cases and experiment specifications before they are uh, particular or corresponding uh, experiment is implemented uh, in simulation or in a laboratory environment or in a combination hardware and loop uh, setting. Uh, tools and services for lab uh, interfacing and data exchange. So we are developed also in the uh, previous project in theory and in uh, Irrigrid one uh, quite interesting concepts uh, uh, called Chanda, for example, where we had also the possibility to connect different laboratory automation systems together for more comprehensive uh, test setups uh, uh, compared to single uh, site uh, test setups. 
Uh, and here the goal is to further develop uh, these methods and technologies. And besides that, we are also working on training education. Uh, so that means to educate uh, young researchers, uh, PhD students, and energy system professionals in our new developments. Uh, also, I think we can consider this webinar as a kind of a training uh, educational uh, related event. So in the past, uh, in year grade one, uh, uh, we had a lot of uh, training schools. Uh, you can see here some figures uh, or photos uh, from such uh, training schools, uh, workshops, uh, and also webinars. Moreover, also open uh, access laboratory education is in our focus for year grade two. So I think this is a very brief overview about the project uh, in, in the next following uh, minutes, uh, as already introduced by uh, Graham and um, Mohamed. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, we are going into more deep, uh, into more detail uh, related to the irrigated topics with the lab access program in general and the virtual services and some examples. So that brings me to the end uh, and I uh, hand over to the next speaker, which is Emilio Rodriguez from Tecnalia. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I guess uh, you are seeing my presentation. Yes, yes. Could see it. Okay, okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Emilio Rodriguez from Tecnalia in Spain. I'm the manager of the laboratory access in Ericrit uh, 2.0. And it is a pleasure for me to give a brief overview of this uh, core activity of the, of the project. Um, okay. Well, as, as Thomas has mentioned, uh, Erigrid is not a conventional research project funded by the European Commission, but an infrastructure project. This means that our main goal is to provide access to our facilities to external research groups investigating into smart grids and smart energy systems uh, that have the need of testing of uh, or validating some of the concepts, but don't have the proper equipment, don't have the, the, the lab installation for, for that. So what we do is we open the doors of our labs and also provide technical support during the experiment implementation of the, of the experiments of, the, of their projects. Uh, and not only that, we use our project dissemination channels to promote uh, the, the, the results obtained during, during this uh, uh, laboratory stays. Uh, and everything uh, free of charge. Yeah? Well, not exactly, but it's, it's free of charge. It's funded by the European Commission under certain conditions. And this includes also the trips, uh, the accommodation, the subsistence of all the user group members. Um, so it sounds it sounds quite quite good, I would say. Okay, so the, the, the user experiments will be implemented in a pan-European infrastructure of 21 laboratories distributed in 13 European countries. Uh, all of us using uh, a set of integrated methodologies and procedures. Uh, I would like to, to present you a few photos on some of the, of the laboratories, not all of them, but you can see our lab in Norway or in Austria, also in the UK, also in the Netherlands, in Greece, also in, in Spain and the Netherlands again, just to, to have some flavor about it. Okay, so who can apply for this? Well, I think that the conditions are not very, not very uh, hard to meet. It must be a research group or an individual uh, coming from a university, a research center, or even from the industry are very much welcome. Located in the European Union or member states, in principle, because we are also allowed to give some access, limited access, 20% of the total access we have to provide to, to non-EU organizations. So the rest of the world uh, but uh, two main conditions uh, must be fulfilled here one is the so-called transnational characteristics which basically means that the country uh, of, the, of the lab must be different than the country of the user institutions please note that here we are not talking about the nationality of the user group members but the country of the organizations for which they are working and the second condition is that they must be able to disseminate the results of the access uh, publicly. That is, that is very, very important. Let's have a look to the timeline of the process. It's quite, let's say, logical, I would say. It's a sequential process. Uh, basically, we open the call for, for proposals every four months, and we keep it open for three months. 
uh, after the three months, we close uh, the call and we start with the evaluation of the received proposal. Normally, this takes one month, maybe one month and a half. Our aim is one, one month for sure. And uh, after that, when all the proposals are evaluated, we notify the results to the users. Uh, for the accepted proposals, they have to implement the projects in the labs within the next six, uh, six months. Typical duration of the access is around one month, is from three to five weeks, uh, I would say, with a maximum duration of three months, if very well, if very well justified. It's not very common at all in any grid to have such a long uh, access in the in the labs and when the access uh, finishes the user group uh, has uh, uh, two months for for the mandatory reporting about the access about the uh, experiment results okay so uh, since uh, we are opening calls every four months this means that we have some kind of overlapping not exactly an overlapping but uh, 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 if we we have, for example, the first call, when we finish the evaluation of the proposal received for that call, we are also ready to open the second call. When we are finishing the evaluation of the proposal received for that second call, we are ready to open the third call and, and so on. So all in all, as you can see, three, uh, three calls can be open or will be open in, in a year. Okay, so how to, how to apply? Uh, the interested uh, the potential users must go to our website, basically. So everything is there, the information about the conditions, about the procedures, very, very important about the, the descriptions of the of the laboratories that are involved in this in this opportunity, the equipment which is available, but also the expertise and the individual conditions that apply for, for the different labs. Uh, of course, uh, in the website, they can contact uh, the labs for, for getting further details or clarify any administrative or technical issue. Also very important in the website, uh, they will find uh, some documentation, which is very, very helpful here. Uh, a guide that contains the explanation that they're giving right now, and also a, a template for the, for the proposal to, to be filled. And once the, this uh, document, this proposal is filled, they have to submit it electronically by means of our proposal submission system, which is based in a tool very well known. This is called ConfTool. They have to go there, they have to create an account to log in, and uh, they will be ready to upload uh, the PDF document. Okay, so uh, once uh, the proposal is there, so when it comes the, the, the evaluation, uh, let's say, a step. It is done in, in, two, in two stages that run actually in parallel. One is the so-called pre-screening, where the selected labs by the user perform the first uh, check of the feasibility of the project. Normally, it's uh, mainly uh, it's, it's technical, but also uh, economic uh, feasibility of the project. And also, second stage is the, the evaluation itself that is done by the by the an independent uh, selection panel, which is formed by more than 100 international experts coming from the academia and also from the industry. Uh, they are able to cover all the fields that are involved in these smart grids, let's say uh, umbrella or smart energy systems, umbrella, umbrella. This means that they, they are able to cope with uh, a power system, but also ICT issues, cyber security or automation, uh, of course. Uh, Okay, our intention is that each proposal is assessed by three to five experts, so it's quite well uh, reviewed, I have to say. And the evaluation is based on four criteria. One is the general quality and organization of the document, the, the, the proposal. Second one is the scientific merit, meaning that uh, we check the, the relevance or the degree of innovation of the project that is proposed by the users. The third category is uh, about uh, possible extension of the lab capabilities, possible improvement of the know-how of the procedures that are followed by the, by the lab that, that is going to be involved. And the last one is uh, to assess uh, the degree of compliance with the EU priorities or the EU uh, policies. Okay, so uh, once the proposal has been evaluated and um, for those that uh, are accepted, uh, the, the user group must to contact the, the assigned lab uh, to agree on the period, to agree on the on the 
work plan to be to be followed. So a contract must be signed to be on the safe side, covering issues like uh, confidentiality, liability, safety, and and, and so on. Uh, also, uh, at the end of the access, it's very important to sign a declaration of use uh, accounting for the number of access days, uh, uh, which is the fundamental unit of measurement uh, of the performance of, of a grid. So, yeah, it's not uh, so complicated. And once the uh, access uh, has finished, uh, it is mandatory the user group must report on the results. Uh, first, they have to field an online questionnaire. Uh, for the European Commission. This is, has nothing to do with the lab, it's something between the user group and the European Commission. Uh, and also, which is important, they have to prepare the, the, the technical report, okay. with the exception of SMEs, but uh, this requirement does not apply to, to a small and medium enterprises. And the technical uh, report um, uh, will be made publicly available through our website. Okay. Also, it is important that the user notify us, notify Eric Reed about future publications in conferences, in journals, uh, where the access results uh, can be further disseminated. Okay, I guess that probably <clears throat> most of the people uh, attending this webinar are thinking that lab access means that the user is physically present, is physically on site in the lab during the experiments. Uh, they are right, normally this is the case, but there are another modality, there are another possibility that is so-called remote lab access, where the user is not in the lab during the project implementation, so the experiments are performed by the host lab staff, and the user, of course, can follow, can supervise somehow uh, the, 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 the experiments uh, by means of uh, teleconference or a phone call, that is the basic way of doing that, of course, and uh, can maybe depending on the lab capabilities can use for example a remote SCADA or more sophisticated solution but that very much depends on the on the individual lab possibilities of course as you can imagine this uh, way uh, of uh, getting access has uh, several advantages mainly for the safety of the users and of course related to lower expenses that are, are involved and uh, as you can imagine, this is a very convenient solution now during this uh, pandemic situation. Okay, for the rest, it's quite similar to the, let's say, conventional uh, physical lab access. Uh, so the lab must be prepared in advance for the experiments, a contract must be signed. Uh, of course, uh, the mandatory uh, reporting uh, still applies and, and so on. Okay, so uh, certainly, uh, okay, so my, my, my last, last slide. Yeah, my last slide takes this opportunity to let you know about the course, about the dates that are, that are involved. Uh, the first call close last December. Uh, we received 11 proposals, which is quite, quite good, I would say, uh, considering this COVID-19 uh, situation. We have now our second call open until the, the, the end of uh, April, uh, and, and other calls will come in the future, as I mentioned, every every four months. So I encourage you uh, to, to to analyze, to consider this opportunity, and uh, please do not miss uh, if, you, if you, need, you have the need. OK, so that's, uh, that's all from my side for the moment. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emilio. And now, uh... I would like to leave the floor to Kai to give us his interesting presentation. Yeah, thank you, Mohamed Singh. Thank you uh, for handing over. Um, so this presentation is supposed to report an experience of remote lab access, um, like we performed some remote lab access in the Aerogrid One project, but it was not intended. It was really more of an accidental event. So. Um, it might be that you take this experience and you take this experience with a grain of salt. If you do prepare for remote lab access, you will probably less stumble into it than we did. Um, so first as a disclaimer, and I think that was said already, um, but I'd like to visualize it. Um, the virtual access is meant as a service where you basically as one user experience certain data, a very provided experience. Um, 
naturally we do not uh, use virtual reality in that way um, but later Stefan will explain how this works in area grid for the remote access it's it's a real lab access project so you will have a real lab available you will have a real team that you work with and i think the close collaboration can also be online we have all experienced this over the last year um, that you can be quite productive also in a remote setting um, but you'll also have a real data and you'll have real bugs um, so the collaboration is going to be important to be facilitated properly um, for this specific if, if experience we looking at the villas for airy grid um, lab access projects in area grid one um, which was planned as a sort of semi-external internal collaboration we have tu delft that was an area grid partner uh, dtu um, also area grid partner and rwth aachen at that time not area grid partner um, and the idea was to look at geographically distributed um, hardware in the loop simulation but also geographically in real-time simulation um, after some preparation we uh, decided to split this into two states to um, two experiments one part one was a pure real-time simulation geographically distributed and the part two was then looking at geographically distributed power hardware in the loop um, where we're looking at DTU facilities um, being um, distributed so but that's what we're going to look at later um, ge geographically distributed power hardware in the loop means as in a power hardware in the loop you have a digital read time simulator and you have the um, converter or amplifier and hardware under test but in between you have a network setup so you need some kind of real-time gateway uh, setup and that's something that has been worked with in area grid one but also in parallel RWTH Aachen had developed this Villas not concept which one we wanted to try here um, so um, here just geographically what distribution we had we have TU Delft uh, RWTH and then within Denmark um, also we have two different sites so Riese site and Lumbi site which will both belong to the power lab um, laboratory of DTU a bit closer zoomed in um, so we have um, the Lungby campus um, where the RT RTDS is um, sited and the syslab um, on the Riesel campus so there's um, in straight line distance 30 kilometers half an hour by car um, and 2.5 nanoseconds as a digital coupling um, and in this diagram you can see the setup that we'll look at also in the following slides um, we have a network connection here's where these 2.5 nanoseconds apply um, to villas node um, which then relays the data over another um, loop which relays the data then to control a converter and then in that in the laboratory we have one resistors load and some cables that present the network setup so this has been um, a experiment that was aimed at developing something that works remote so that gives us a little bit of an advantage in that sense trying out these things um, and the access timeline um, which is the main purpose here to for this presentation is to understand um, we had two actually on-site accesses in october and november 19 and then we started with remote access in february then the pandemic hit us um, and we all had to go home and had a complete remote access and that was possible so just to give you a familiarity with uh, who's been involved um, Stefan who will present later um, was part of the team um, and Maria um, both from RWTH Aachen and then ha from DTU and Virtual Bell and TU Dortmund uh, sorry TU Delft um, were involved and here also all on site in the Syslab facilities um, you might see from this quinting eyes it was on site you can get late hours um, so what they came up with in this preparation um, is this setup um, so we have a, a simple network a distribution network simulated on a real-time simulator and then we have on um, the syslab laboratory being um, remotely coupled um, via this converter um, the subject of this specific test is that we had a slower converter so we have a very fast simulation with a high 
uh, rate here, and then we have a slower interface to this converter, right? Um, and that was kind of the research subject here. How can you make that possible? Um, but also what's important is to realize is, okay, you see the physical access here as in something on the RTDS, something in the laboratory, and the laboratory part can get more complex, the RTDS can, can be more complex, but we're studying the digital ele element here of it. So that's here in the top, a lot of communication and um, a lot of computers. So roughly five computers that directly are relevant here um, as part of the experiments and interfacing with the lab, you have then um, one controlling the, con the converter and one converting, controlling the load. In a larger setup, you would probably have more computers um, in the experiment. Um, but it means you have three to four controlling PCs that you need to uh, supervise during these experiments. If we now go to the experience perspective, um, then once we had remote, this was the critical bottleneck. How do we access all these remote control uh, computers? Because the laboratory is already remotely controlled by these PCs. Um, um, and given that we already had a collaboration before, we had talked a lot on Skype, it was quite natural to go with a Skype and screen share approach to um, live coordination of the experiments. Um, we were on the on the physical side, the um, DTU folks were still sitting in one room, um, um, room in um, in Riese, so on the Syslab, uh, close to the Syslab laboratory. So the experience is usually in Syslab that you have some remote control, um, but you're on site to be able to fix things. Um, so then when the pandemic hit us, uh, we all had to go home and we were questioning, was it possible to even continue the, the elaborate ex experiment? We were just missing a little bit to be able to complete this. Um, we tried and, and it worked out. So we, we managed to get the right IT set up um, with the help of our IT departments and our, um, to, to get a safe setup where we could, each from home, I plotted um, two locations. So everyone was really fully remote accessing the lab and we only had one lab technician on site. So this is more remote than you than you will need, probably. Um, but it's been possible to go that far remote. And that's mainly the story here. Um, so um, I don't want to spend much time on our experiment results. You can look them up. Um, it was a very interesting work. Um, which is also about remote testing. Um, but I will not go into the results here now. Um, for those that would like to look at the results, you can also look at the diagram below. Um, from the lab, remote lab access experience, I would like to highlight that um, we had a two-step uh, on-site preparation, and then we can go over to an online um, collaboration. And we had a team working already, so the frame for the online cooperation was quite straightforward. We had a fixed um, experiment protocol that we were following. Um, we knew where our data was going, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was extremely helpful to have the lab automation as also Stefan highlights here. Um, I think the benefits that you get from um, this remote part of the lab access is mainly two things. Um, you can reduce the um, travel time. Um, so this, and you can be more flexible. So that means you have more um, or less pressure on, on having everything fixed on site and then sort of um, re be able to iterate a little more. Um, what we haven't tried is the reverse situation to start remote, but I'm not entirely worried that it's impossible. You just have to keep in mind that, that it's like any online collaboration with a complex subject. You need to fix the frame properly. So this is, as my last slide, I would just want to um, compare what we have experienced here in Eric Good One. Um, was one of two um, um, experiments or that were using online uh, collaboration with remote access. So we had uh, a Villas for Eric that I just presented, and then there was the H2AI project with the University of Strathclyde, um, where there was also three remote access days. Um, so in sum uh, summa, I would say remote access is um, possible in principle. It's clearly different from virtual access, so no need to confuse that further. Uh, and then we can um, 
see this as an efficient alternative to to doing something completely on site, um, but it's probably best combined if there's if that's a possibility. And I think it can be con used both in preparation, but certainly as we've shown for follow up of ex previous visits. So I would like to thank you for your attention um, and then hand over to um, the next speaker who is Stefan Vogel. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kai. Okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Stefan Vogel. I'm um, a research associate uh, at RWTH Aachen um, uh, under the team of Professor Monti. Um, and um, we as RWTH Aachen, we are a new participant in Ericrit. So in the, in the first iteration of the project, we are we're not a member uh, of the consortium. We only participated in the Villas for Ericrit exchange. So now that we are within Ericrit, I have here the role of the work package leader for the virtual access work package, which I want to present here in the next 10 minutes. Um, I will start with a brief definition of what virtual access actually is and how it uh, is different from the remote access. Then I will cover um, the specific uh, of how we implement Eric, uh, virtual access within the Eric project. I will show you how to actually access and use our facilities yourself. And I will give a, a brief overview of which facilities we provide. Um, and after this presentation, we will then actually uh, have two small demonstration of two of the facilities. So what, what is virtual, virtual access actually? Virtual access ensures free of charge access to um, electronic infrastructure. This could be, for example, um, some sophisticated computer services, some computing power. So for example, a high performance computer, uh, special networks, uh, databases, and, and data banks of, of data which you could use. So it's, it's usually either some, some sort of data which is provided as data as a service or some computing um, facility where you can, for, for example, perform some simulations as a service. Um, virtual access is a, is a nice tool which allows you to participate in, in such a virtual research community because in, in some of the tools, it allows you to uh, collaborate with, with other uh, partners to use the tool as a collaboration platform. Um, and it's also nice to see that uh, the virtual exit uh, as is, it's, it's not just a tool which we see in our community in, in energy research, but also in, in a lot of other uh, fields where each of the fields implements virtual access in a little different way, which we will see in a second. But it's important to not confuse virtual access with remote access. Because um, remote access usually means that we have some sort of physical lab or physical lab infrastructure that could be, for example, a real-time simulator or some lab equipment. For such physical infrastructures, you usually need to somehow allocate the usage or reserve the, the usage of this equipment. And, and this is something which has to be done manually. So you need to coordinate with the uh, users on site, whether they need access to their own lab equipment or not. In, in contrast, virtual access uh, is a scheme where we don't have this uh, limitation. So the, the goal of virtual access is that you can access this facility anytime without any restriction, without any prior coordination. And that means that in contrast to the transnational access scheme, Virtual access does not require any application, so we, you don't need to apply for using our facilities here. There are no proposals which are which uh, should be or must be submitted, and there is no selection process which will select you as a, um, as a as a user who can access the facility. That means everybody can can open and log in into the, our facilities right away. You could do it. Um, 
at this minute. And you can start uh, using the facilities or just checking yourself whether you, you like them, whether you could use them for your research. Um, this access is usually done through communication networks. So everything you need is just basically in most cases a web browser and the, the right entry point where you can access the services. Um, and, and that's basically possibly possible by eliminating most of the administrative obstacles. And yeah, once you use virtual access, you're really not obliged to any sort of reporting. You are not required to publish your results. You're not required to, to write paper about it or report to us back at all. We could do it and we never really noticed that you used our services and that's totally fine. In contrast to the transnational access, and as a consequence of making it so simple, we cannot provide direct uh, individual support on site. So you cannot expect to call us uh, or have a chat session where, where we help and support you right away, um, because that would be too much effort on, on our side to implement this. But we have an alternative uh, way of, of um, supporting users of our virtual access facilities. Yeah, as said before, virtual access is a novelty in Ericrit 2.1. We, we didn't have it in Ericrit 1. Um, virtual access in Ericrit 2 is provided by eight partners, uh, which provide access to uh, nine facilities in total. And the virtual access is offered during the complete project lifetime. So um, we started last April and we had uh, the first uh, virtual access facilities online um, roughly last uh, September, uh, with more coming now online um, one at a time. And they will stay online until the project end, which is in September 24. And also a nice side effect, which we see is that most of the virtual access facilities are um, built using open source software solutions. So um, it's not that these facilities provide you access to some closed source MATLAB or um, closed source simulation tools, which you cannot install yourself or where you possibly need a license to, to actually use them. Pretty much we, everything we do in these virtual access facilities is based on open source tools. And uh, the virtual access work package in Ericrit is also interweaved with other project activities. So we have the, the joint research activities where we uh, intend to continue the development to improve the, uh, the virtual access facilities with the feedback we receive from our users. And we have the network activities where we plan to incorporate the virtual access facilities into, um, for example, webinars or uh, video tutorials which demonstrate how to use them. So in order to access uh, virtual access facilities, we have uh, multiple steps, uh, but they are really fairly easy to, to go through. Uh, usually you start with the Ericrit website where we have a dedicated uh, page listing all of the facilities. There you find a short description. You can select the one which you are interested in. After that, you will be forwarded to a short questionnaire, which is really only an asking you to fill in, I think five, five of, um, input fields like your um, affiliation, where you come from, how you plan to intend the facilities uh, and so on. After completing this questionnaire, you will be directly forwarded to the partner site to the facility itself, where, where you can start using the, the facility. In addition to that, we have uh, established a discussion forum, um, which we plan to use as the, the main way of uh, supporting our users. Uh, the discussion forum is pretty stand, a pretty standard web forum, so the users can register there, they can ask questions, and all the partners who provide the access are there as well. They will be notified about new questions and um, you can exchange um, your experience there as well. So the, the big idea here is that Using this forum, we have also a way of establishing a knowledge base. We can document the questions which have been asked before, and new users can easily um, get up to speed. 
This is the website we see, uh, the ERIC website, where we see the selection of uh, virtual access facilities. And um, you can click on any of them. After that, you will be, um, after a short description, you will be forwarded to this questionnaire. So you see we only have actually four fields which you have to answer. This is completely voluntary, um, but we mainly need it for reporting to the European Commission. Um, also, an, a new addition is that some of these facilities, as well as the um, discussion forum itself, are all integrated into a project-wide single sign-on. So you actually only need um, a single login account, which then allows you to access all of these uh, services. Or no, not all of them, but we have now two facilities participating, uh, as well as the forum itself. Yeah, and, and here you can see a, a screenshot of the forum. And now I will start briefly going over the different facilities which we provide. So the first one is from RSE. Um, it's a cloud database platform um, providing you access to historical uh, and, and real-time data of a low-voltage microgrid. Um, and it's implemented using a time series database um, and using Grafana as a front end. And, and that allows you to go through, I think, up to a bit more than a year of data they have now inside um, of their own microgrid. In addition, there's also an object storage um, providing you with topology assets and some test case descriptions. And here we see um, a little picture um, illustrating the microgrid at RSE in the distributed energy resource testing facility. And for some of these uh, components here, you will then have access to this um, historic and real-time data. The next facility is from AIT, it's called the Smartest SimLab. It's a simulation as a service platform um, built on Mosaic and uh, Jupyter. So from uh, Mosaic, there is a Jupyter extension um, which allows you to build your own Mosaic simulation and scenarios and then execute them completely um, over the Jupyter platform. And the Smartest SimLab is also integrated into the single sign-on service, which I presented before. And here we see a little screenshot of this facility. So for those who are not familiar with Jupyter, and we will see it later as well, it's a completely web-based tool um, which basically gives you a complete development environment. So you can have these multiple tabs here. You can write your own code. You have some controls to start and stop the simulation. So it's very, in, in some sort, it's similar to some of the desktop tools you use for your simulations already. But this brings everything into the cloud. So we have everything running on the servers of AIT itself. Um, and you as a user basically only need your web browser and nothing else. But of course, uh, these tools allow you also to provide your own data, your own uh, grid models, your own time series data, which you then can use and feed into these simulations. And later on, you also have the chance to extract the results there and use them for your own dissemination. The next um, facility is from ICSCS and TUA. Um, it's called Virtual Lab. It's mainly an educational simulation tool. They provide two uh, experiments um, where the students can adjust a few values and we, they have a simulation running in the background and providing the students with some real-time uh, real um, simulation um, dashboards. Um, I have some uh, two screenshots here. Uh, this is the first experiment where they have um, I, um, scenario of a, of a simple voltage control with a PV inverter. Uh, students can adjust the reactive power control as well as uh, provide an active power set point and they will see basically the how the voltage reacts on uh, when adjusting these values. The second experiment um, is a small microgrid um, where they can adjust one of the loads in the microgrid and then see how the, the other uh, components in the grid um, react to that. 
And it's also important to note that these two virtual labs, they are modeled um, according to the physical lab which NTU and UA has on site. So it's a nice way of them, of, of for the students to, to approach the lab, to first learn how it's structured, and then maybe later on starting your thesis at the lab and, and using the equipment uh, themselves. The next um, facility is from University of uh, Strathclyde. It's the Smart Grid Monitoring and Visualization Platform. It's provided by the Dynamic uh, Power Systems Laboratory. Um, and it's mainly built around two uh, phaser me measurement units, which are um, deployed in the British uh, grid. So there's one in the University of Strathclyde and another one in their Power, uh, power Networks Demonstration Center. And from these two PMUs, they provide you a near real time and historical access to the grid frequency, the Rokov, as well as some uh, yeah, fa uh, voltage phaser diagrams and um, um, also historical um, composition of the generation in the British grid. I also have some screenshot for that. So here we see the uh, generation mix uh, in, in Great Britain and how it's uh, evolved uh, historically. And here we see the live data from the grid with a grid frequency uh, and uh, phaser diagrams. So the, the last two um, facilities, which I will quickly touch here, will also be pre presented um, is, as a live demo in the, in the next two sessions. The, uh, the first one is also from ICCS and GNA. Um, it's a tool for designing uh, small scale uh, wind turbine generators. Um, and it's composed of several sub tools. Uh, and, and some of them are using um, finite element method magnetics. So this is an open source tool for doing uh, simulation of, of magnetic effects. And they also have a quite interesting uh, tool for doing uh, for using particle swarm optimization to actually then optimize some of the parameters for constructing a generator. But I think I'm, I'm sure this will be also demonstrated later. And last, we have the uh, VLab uh, from RWTH. That's our facility. Um, it's also based on on Jupiter, very similar to uh, the infrastructure from AIT. Um, but in contrast, we don't combine it with Mosaic, but instead we have our own um, simulation tool. Um, it's called DPSIM. It allows us to perform um, EMT, electromagnetic transient, load flow, and dynamic phase of simulations um, completely from within the Python, uh, Python and Jupyter Lab uh, framework. You can um, define your grid models either in Python or C code. So you could script any tool which constructs your grid model, or you could read in the grid model uh, from the con uh, from com common information model files. And the nice side effect of having everything in Python is that you can completely define such a simulation uh, from the modeling to scenario definitions, so what you actually want to simulate. So you can parameterize um, the simulation. You can then execute uh, it either once or um, multiple scenarios at the same time, and then later on do the completely complete post-processing analysis of your results also in Python. So, and that allows you to have basically all the complete workflow uh, in, in one tool. And we are currently working on also a tool which allows us to, um, to extend uh, Jupyter with a tool we called Villas Web. Uh, which then gives us also some live and, and real-time dashboards. So we can actually perform real-time simulations there as well, and then provide the user a, a near instant feedback on, on the current simulation state. Yeah, this brings me to the end of this uh, first um, session. Um, I presented or gave a quick overview of six of the uh, nine virtual access facilities. We have three more which are in the pipeline and we expect them to go online um, this year. And then uh, for the future, um, because I only could very briefly touch uh, most of the facilities, um, we plan to have more in-depth uh, webinars and, and workshops 
um, focusing on the individual facilities and giving you some more in-depth uh, details and examples how to use them. Okay, that's everything I have for the first um, presentation about the adequate virtual access facilities. Um, I will now switch to the next presentation and give you a little, a little demo of our um, virtual access facility at RWTH. And we call it Virtual Lab. It's a web-based simulation platform. So you can use it for simulation as a service. You can bring your own model and data files into the platform. And of course, you can take away your simulation results and then publish later in, in a journal if you want to. Um, the Virtual Lab is composed of two components. So it's, it's largely uh, built around uh, Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Hub. Which, which provide you this interactive computing environment in, in your web browser, and I will show it in a second. And uh, the second main component is this DPSIM simulator, uh, which is itself implemented in, in C++ and basically uh, developed by us um, also as uh, open source software. All of that is running on our own Kubernetes cloud, so we have a small um, on-premises cloud, which runs at RWTH, built uh, out of around uh, 10 uh, servers. Um, so we have plenty, plenty of computing power to also perform some longer or more complex simulations there. And the nice thing is that due to this Kubernetes cloud, even multiple users which use our service at the same time get distributed across these 10 machines. Um, and we don't have any problems of the, in, in regards to scalability. And also one important point is really from the ground up, the, the full stack of the software which we use to build VLab is open source. And that really starts from the operating system, basically Linux, then to the cloud system, Kubernetes, Jupyter, DPSIM, all of that um, is open source. And I will have a link on the uh, last slide where you can actually see the source code. And um, that's very important to us. Because um, as researchers, we want to give you basically a full insight how each of the simulation models is implemented, each of the components, and also provide you with the possibility to extend it for your own research. So um, we are very open here, uh, and we really encourage you also to, to contribute there. So if you have any new developments, any new models, um, we are very welcome uh, for your submissions there, and we will want to incorporate that. Also, it may be interesting to note that um, since a few uh, months, we are now a partner of the Linux Foundation, so the, the industry um, organization which, which um, accelerates and, and supports the development of Linux and many other open source projects. And the Linux Foundation has a, a new sub-project which, which is called LF Energy. Um, in which we now uh, basically are contributing DPSIM and a few of our other open source tools to continue the, the development of these open source solvers and tools um, under a broader community. Okay, uh, quickly um, a few words about Jupyter. It's this web-based interactive development environment. Um, it allows you to document your code and, and uh, research in something called Jupyter Notebooks, which combines basically code, data, and your annotations. You can write some comments, you can include LaTeX formulas and so on. And it's highly extensible, um, has a user interface. We, we see this, that um, the Mosaic has a good, Mosaic simulation uh, tool has a good extension, extending a Jupyter with additional controls and, and editors for editing a Mosaic scenario. And besides Python, it supports many other programming languages um, such as Octave, Julia, R, C++, and so on. And uh, Jupyter, I think many of you maybe are already familiar with that. It's a, bit, it's a tool which is used 
quite widely in the research and edu educational community. So we have many universities where, which are already basing their uh, courses on Jupyter, provide maybe instead of a PDF script, um, they provide uh, the, the lecture materials now in, in form of Jupyter notebooks. In order to make Jupyter notebooks accessible um, to a bigger group of users, we use a Jupyter Hub, which is a multi-user um, tool for or a tool for managing multiple users and running this basically on premises on on a cloud system. And the nice thing is, it provides you with persistent home directories. So every user who logs in gets their own little space of of where they can store files and results uh, before coming back later, maybe. A week or a month later to pick up your work and have the same state. And it allows us to yeah, have the scalable deployment in, in Kubernetes where we can really scale up to uh, thousands of users at, at the same time. And also this integration into a single sign-on service. And yeah, here's, here you see a little screenshot of the tool, um, which if you look at uh, this in more detail, pretty much looks like a development environment. So if you're familiar with Visual Studio um, or Eclipse, for example, these, these uh, development tools or RT Lab from Opel RT, for example, they look pretty much the same with a big difference that you don't need to install anything on your local machine. And you can start, you can get started right away. And that's, and that's a very big plus if we want to use these tools in, in the education and teaching. Um, because for many students, it's a big obstacle to install, let's say, a five gigabyte MATLAB install or something like this. So um, we see that in, in our courses where we use these tools, we can, yeah, by using Jupyter, we can enable much more students actually using and trying out these simulations uh, on their own behalf, which they wouldn't have done before because they would require to install some, some big tools. A few words about TPSIM. Um, it's completely in-house developed at um, RWTH. It's a modified nodal analysis solver implemented in C++. Um, as in the name suggests, it started as a solver for dynamic phasers, where we basically simulate um, kind of the baseband signal instead of the instantaneous 50 hertz signal we usually have. Um, but nowadays, it also supports load flow simulations as well as the EMT style simulations. Um, because C++ is hard for some, um, we added the Python um, interface to it. So you can use pretty, most of the features also from with it Python. It can read in common information model files and has the interface to Villas um, for providing interfaces to external tools. So we basically have a clear separation. DPSIM is, is a simulation kernel. It does a simulation and all the interfaces IO to external parts is handled by our Villas node gateway. It also performs real time as well as offline execution. Um, but there we have to be a bit careful. We mainly use the real time features if we perform dynamic phaser simulations because performing real time simulations for the EMT style simulations can become tricky due to the time steps. And yeah, it's also open source. And now I can quickly jump to our live demo. And I hope that all of that will work. I basically start by accessing the Erika web, website. If we go to the lab access um, section here, we will see the list of all virtual access facilities, as I showed in my previous presentation. I will select the RWTH. Description here, we get a short description and the button to access the facility. Then we get this um, little user questionnaire, which I fill out. And then I get immediately directed to um, our VLAB. Here I am now asked to log in again, and I'm using the single sign-on server, which I mentioned also earlier. And this brings me to my uh, Jupyter environment now. It's a pretty, pretty powerful tool because here you can write any Python code, you can even um, 
get your own terminal uh, where you can run your code and, and so on. Um, but I will quickly start because we don't have that much time to show you a brief example of such a DP sim simulation. Um, so you see here one of these notebooks where we basically uh, can interleave any um, documentation, formulas, even images and videos could be included here with some Python code. And this, this Python code can now be ex executed and users can also modify and, and edit, edit this Python code. So we have a few examples provided here. And in the next cell, we see how we can basically build up a, a very simple uh, grid topology. So I define a few um, nodes within my grid, have a ground node and then, then three uh, others and a few components like a voltage source, a resistor, inductor, and so on. I can parameterize each of them all in my Python code. And last but not least, I can connect the individual components to my previously defined nodes and then define a system topology where I say I have these simulation nodes and have these components. Um, after doing that, basically the tool will construct a system matrix and then um, I can also have a small graph-like visualization of my topology before then performing the simulation with a modified analysis solver. And we see I can have, I can adjust the time step, simulation duration, and so on. I have a logger, which allows me to select a few values uh, of interest um, or signals of interest, uh, which are then locked to a CSV file. And last but not least, I can plot my results here, for example. If we look, we have this log directory, which gives us then like a, a couple of log files. We can look basically at the CSV file, look at the results, or do any post-processing as I have done here in Python directly. Um, so as my time runs out, I will just quickly go through a more complex example, which we also have here. This is a WSCC 9 bus system. I will quickly execute it. This is reading the grid topology actually from uh, a ZIM file. So we have a bunch of XML files. And then I can also get this graphical representation again of the grid topology, which looks a little bit different from the typical nine bus uh, topology you might be familiar with, but that's just because we are using graphless here to do the rendering. I then go ahead and I modify the grid topology, which we have seen uh, loaded from the SIM file by adding a PQ load, which we then in, now also see uh, here. And this PQ load now gets um, gets um, changed. The, the load set point gets changed during the simulation. So we add an event here at 0.2 seconds into the simulation. We close the breaker, and thereby we can introduce some transient into our model. The simulation is now running here, and then I will quickly go through the analysis. I can look at the voltage waveforms, which we see after the, um, yeah, after the transient. Okay, um, there are a, a few more examples, uh, little and more complex, um, but the big point here is that you have the full uh, ability of modifying and, and define your own scenarios. This brings me to my last slide, which is a little outlook how we plan to continue the development of the VLAB. Um, we have another project going on uh, internally at RWTH, which is called SLU, or Second Life for Energy Vendor. And I'm not sure with, of, if everybody knows the, the game Second Life. It's a virtual reality game from Linden Labs. You see a little picture here. It provides you a virtual reality to walk around, and you can implement any some sorts of virtual experiences here. And the idea was that we build a simulation tool not exactly using the, the Second Life game, but have an experience for students which is very similar to it. Um, and to do that, we extend the Jupyter environment. We add our Villas web tool. 
which is a tool which allows us to manage simulation scenarios. So we can have multiple models, we can have multiple simulators, and the Villas web tool is managing all of that. So we can assign a model to a simulator, we can do an, we can execute the simulation then, um, and we basically also have um, a database of past simulations and their results. So it's kind of a logbook for ourselves as well. And the nice thing, if we do these simulations in Villas web, we are performing basically real-time simulations. So users can have a real-time dashboard to actually see uh, the effects of, for example, adjusting a slider in the dashboard of a load and then see how this will affect the simulation. Okay, that's um, all from my side. Uh, here are the few links. You can also find them later on in the, in the deck set, which Thomas will publish. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. So, going to the next presentation, Costas. So, I would like to give you the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, you can uh, see my screen, yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I will be uh, presenting you the um, online tools of the ICC SNT UA called Open AFPM uh, tools. Uh, these tools have been developed. Um, uh, let me. Okay. Uh, these tools have been developed uh, uh, in the Smart Roo, uh Research Group, led by Professor Nikos Hazjargiriu, and it's dedicated uh, sub research group on uh, rural electrification, uh, the rural electrification research group, and uh, they have been developed uh, in collaboration and um, for the use of the Wind Empowerment Network, which is a global network of uh, practitioners, researchers, and manufacturers of uh, locally manufactured small wind turbines, um, with uh, about 70 members in 30 countries, and most of them performing uh, rural electrification activities uh, on the field. So the main idea of the, of the tool was, um, apart from its educational benefits, uh, for uh, for university students uh, was to assist practitioners on the field in order to be able to um, to modify standard open source wind turbine designs with the materials that, that they could find uh, uh, locally in the market. So the Open AFPM tool essentially uh, is, a, is a simulation tool for uh, the axial flux permanent magnet generator of a small wind turbine and uh, it uses the open source uh, finite element analysis software uh, FEM um, which is um, which is a very pow powerful and open open source tool for um, for performing uh, magnetic analysis of generators and other uh, and other problems and um, as you can see here it is uh, a part of the generator that we are modeling and then um, uh, doing different kinds of designs so the tool set uh, consists of three tools uh, magn afpm which is the more let's say practitioner uh, focused or uh, dedicated tool this is a tool where um, um, the user can input the magnet dimensions that are available uh, to him or her and uh, the specific design of, of the generator uh, required for a specific uh, set of rotor blades will be, uh, will be calculated and presented uh, for the user. Uh, then the user AFPM tool uh, essentially performs a complete um, analysis of the um, of, uh, of this generator using uh, FEM, uh, the simulation software, uh, as it would have been done in a test bench. So the, the user is able to uh, to rotate the, the generator at specific uh, at specific uh, rotational uh, speeds, 
and uh, apply uh, different currents. So this is the part that could be validated uh, experimentally in the NTUA, NTUA labs, which uh, have been some of the transnational access projects that we've done in, uh, in previous uh, years and editions of, uh, of this program. Uh, finally, the OPTA FPM tool um, uh, is, is more uh, research, let's say, or uh, more commercial or manufacturer-centered, uh, uh, and it, it allows for uh, optimizing the magnet dimensions of, uh, of different generators and using a particle swarm optimization and taking into account uh, uh, aspects such as uh, generator efficiency, cost, and mass. But we will uh, have a look at that um, uh, during the demo in a bit more detail. Uh, in addition to, to these tools, there is a, um, there is a let's say, a, a design library. Uh, it's called Design Tips, where uh, the tools are explained and uh, a, a, general, um, a general process of how to use them and what's the background uh, um, for these tools is presented. And finally, there is an interactive, uh, or not, there is a map of uh, where users are located uh, in order to get the feel of, uh, of the global community using them. Uh, so now we will have a look at the tools themselves. This uh, online, um, the online version, the online interface for the tools has been uh, uh, funded by Wizens uh, from the Wuppertal uh, Institute in Germany. And uh, it was uh, part of a knowledge exchange project which we conducted um, uh, in Nepal with local partners and it also included an electrification uh, project. So now I will go to the tool. So once you log into the tool, this is uh, this is your landing uh, page. You can uh, go to the design tips and uh, read through in order to get uh, an overview. There's a discussion forum where uh, uh, you can ask questions and you can see the user locations uh, as we have described. So you could go to new simulation and you can pick uh, one of the three tools. So the, the first uh, tool to use is uh, Magna AFPM, which um, will give you a first overview. So uh, when entering the tool, you'll be asked to give uh, a title and uh, uh, for this specific simulation and then various inputs that have to do with um, with the specific wind turbine uh, that we are designing so that will be its, its uh, turbine radius the efficiency of the blades cutting and uh, nominal wind speed uh, the tip speed ratio uh, at cutting and uh, different other parameters such as the, the the shape of the coils used in the generator, so rectangular, keyhole, or triangular, uh, fill factor of the coils, stator thickness, and then there are also different uh, generator topologies that can be simulated, such as a double rotor or a single, or a single rotor, for example. There can be different uh, magnetic materials used in the simulation. Uh, the number of poles can be varied and uh, here are the magnet dimensions which can be specified by the youth by the user and the uh, yeah and the rotor disk uh, thickness so these are the main um, uh, generator uh, input variables then there are some system uh, inputs so uh, usually these uh, wind turbines are used in off-grid systems uh, with uh, battery-based systems, so this will be the battery voltage, uh, the nominal, the nominal voltage of the of the charge controller, some transmission losses, rectifier losses, so on and so forth, and then some um, costs for different materials in order to get uh, an estimate of the total cost of the generator. So by clicking save, the, 
the simulation will be run, will start running. So then you enter here the main, uh, the main, uh, let's say, list of si simulations. So you will be able to see here your simulation, and it will be um, uh, in progress, and uh, there will be a countdown to how much time it will take. Um, so this is uh, what the result of uh, Magna FPM would lo look like. Uh, this is the actual uh, part of the generator that has been simulated in the in FEM uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the two rotors and uh, the coils in the middle. Uh, there are different uh, kinds of results. Um, for example, let's have a look at um, uh, so these are results for the for the for the rotor so for example you would have uh, what is the other radar radius of the disk so it will define the actual uh, size of uh, of the generator um, other uh, Simulations like uh, if if this uh, if the back iron disk of the of the generator is uh, saturated or not, depending on the thickness entered, uh, flux density in the air gap, so on and so forth. Then there are stator outputs, uh, which is a complete design of the stators. So, for example, uh, how many turns per coil, what uh, wire size. So for each for each one of these, there is also uh, this black uh, text box, which gives a further explanation of, uh, of what this output is. Uh, for example, the heat coefficient, the current density of the generator, and many other outputs such as uh, uh, generator power and uh, basically what actually goes into the batteries. So this is the, the power after the rectifier uh, going into the batteries. And finally, there's also some uh, costs uh, calculated. So this is the total cost of this generator based on the, on the input values of uh, material costs that were given by the user. Um, also, there are quite a lot of, uh, of graphs that one can access. Uh, for example, this is the... Um, this is the torque versus current graph of this generator. So these are the different uh, current steps that uh, have been defined for the simulation. Um, for example, the EMF versus speed uh, graph of the generator and, uh, and many others, including, for example, um, Yeah, and the aspects of the magnetic field and uh, so on and so forth. So if the user wants to do a more in-depth um, um, simulation of, uh, of this generator, then the user would ask uh, the tool to, to perform a, a a user uh, AFPM simulation on the same generator, and this time we would uh, we would have a simulation where uh, the actual uh, rotor is uh, is uh, rotated uh, in the simulation for uh, for different RPM, for different revolutions per minute, and uh, for different currents. So this would be a more precise. Um, result uh, when compared to Magn AFPM. And uh, finally, we will have a look at um, at uh, OPT AFPM. So basically, um, let me just go to the new simulation. So here, uh, the optimal dimensions of uh, of the generator magnets could be um, could be simulated uh, while trying trying to optimize efficiency, cost, and mass. 
uh, with different weightings that's also a possibility and with different uh, design variables so this would be the magnet length uh, the magnet width the magnet thickness and also the stator thickness so the the user needs to define how many particle generations how many times to repeat the optimization and uh, a set of maximum and minimum values for uh, for the different design variables and some general inputs for uh, for the rotor and the results of this would actually show um, how each one of the design variables um, uh, goes to a single value and uh, converges to um, a result for the for the four different uh, design variables and also giving an estimate of uh, of the objective function and its uh, and its parameters so thank you very much this has been uh, an overview of the of the tools of uh, open afpm okay and, uh, yeah if you have any questions you are uh, free to ask in the forums thank you very much thank you costas maybe we could give three minutes as a break for the, our audience and just to grab a, a cup of water and uh, in the meantime i will give the presentation right to venezuelos and please uh, we will be back at 11 or 5 central european time Okay, Benzeros, I guess we could start now, it's 11.05. Okay, thank you very much, Mohammed, and thank you uh, all for connecting. And I'm very also very much thankful of all our colleagues from uh, Eregrid who have presented us of the capabilities of the project, which are so uh, helpful to research and innovation community of Europe. And we, as a, a project, Pantera, we are putting forward uh, uh, our vision for generating a platform, the ERI platform, that is much more than just reliable information to support the energy transition and the research activities in Europe. So we uh, would like to just mention that we are a project uh, financed by the Commission to help research and innovation in the low activity countries of Europe 
there are more than 15 countries in Europe that are not contributing enough in the research and innovation for achieving the objectives of the energy transition 2030 and 2050 targets of Europe. And we, as a platform, we are trying to find ways of helping this. And we, as a Pantera a project, we have put in a process through which we, we aim to bring together activities in Europe that will generate this ERI platform, as we call it, the European Interconnection for Research, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, the platform that is uh, uh, going to be hosted on the JRC Europa Smart Solutions uh, Services area. And this is what is going to give it uh, sustainability as to uh, continue serving the research innovation community of Europe after the end of the project. We are uh, are working until the end of 2022, through which period we are trying to develop as much as we can in support of the research and innovation community of Europe. But afterwards, uh, a service contract supported by DG Energy is going to take over in order to continue this visionary work that we put together through the Pantera project, aiming to serve the communities forward. And we have put together a recap process, as we call it, a research and innovation status and continuous gap analysis for providing solutions to uh, the research and innovation community, both in giving information, but on, not only that. We intend to give access through this platform uh, the uh, tools and means to facilitate the work forward and host activities like what you have seen through Erigrid, but also through other projects to help us to enrich and make a single point of connection for the whole of Europe. So this process that we are putting together is bringing a lot of the activities that are are now happening within Europe and trying to bring together uh, uh, ways and means of developing a process that will continuously enrich the ERI platform for the years ahead and give facilities and, uh, and information and data and knowledge for uh, the research and innovation community to act uh, uh, through that and solve um, and help their research and innovation activities that are lacking within their own country or within their own environment. And so this process is going to be a continuous way forward. We are working through ETIPSnet, the European Technology Innovation Platform for Smart Networks for Energy Transition. We are working with uh, uh, the working groups and uh, uh, experts supporting that together with our experts within the Pantera, Pro, uh, uh, um, Pantera Consortium. We are working through working teams to develop uh, all that is, not all, but substantial things that are required and we consider at this point in time very important for the research and innovation community in Europe like research infrastructure that we have been uh, listening this morning through very great activities and continue that into forward with the next steps of how we can make this research infrastructure in Europe accessible through the ERI platform to the whole of Europe and on a sustainable way because as you heard ERI grid has a a, a period that th through that they will continue their uh, excellent work that they are doing uh, uh, or we are doing because we are partners in this uh, um, we as FOSA in Cyprus we are partners in this uh, uh, consortium and continue the work forward for next generations to come and continuously receiving the services that will be generated in addition, we are working on building regulations and standardization and make it accessible uh, as a means of 
uh, where we are with standards today and where we are with codes today as far as our research and innovation work and what is um, missing, what is lacking, where are the shortcomings and how we can build the way forward. So also we are doing a lot of work in research and innovation mapping and how we can evaluate uh, the progress made for uh, and how we can build the process in order to achieve achieve this uh, forward so how can we make this um, work and function and operate in order to give uh, to the research innovation community uh, the means for achieving this and uh, also we through these working teams we are keeping alert of what is happening elsewhere in, in the world in order to make sure that we support the research innovation uh, work in Europe, taking into consideration what is happening elsewhere. So we are building trustful cooperation with stakeholders. We have put a process forward of how we can achieve that. And this is part of the work within the Pantera project to make sure that we have all that is required to build partnerships, to enrich dialogue, to uh, um, benefit from consultation and communication in order to achieve our objectives. And of course, the ERI platform is not anything that will go on this platform. We would like to put the process forward through which what is coming through. We will, we will blend it in a way that will be made useful for the uh, research and innovation community in Europe to use and also we are going to con constantly enriching the platform, bringing new uh, solutions, new uh, tools, new uh, data information knowledge in order to facilitate the research and innovation work in Europe. And uh, uh, we would like to build on the strengths of projects like Ericrid that we have seen now. And we would like to, uh, uh, to say that what is happening within Ericrid is what we envision to have as accessible to all research and innovation community in Europe. As already said by Ericrid, this is open to all, the, all Europe to use the infrastructure to help the research and innovation, but is limited. Is limited, let's say, for the period that the project is happening, or is limited to the calls that are happening within the year. Our vision is to extend Eric Grid 2 to Eric Grid 3, and through which we would like to facilitate a process through which there is not going to be any limit in conducting your research, provided that there is such capabilities within Europe anywhere where they are and convince the Commission to take this as a responsibility forward in enriching solutions and giving access to the research and innovation community in Europe to use this infrastructure to facilitate their work. In addition, we are building good collaboration with other projects like EDI, like ASSET, through which we would like to facilitate anything that is becoming virtually accessible throughout Europe, which helps educating people, uh, training people, and having means. And we have heard a lot today from what is already happening within the virtual research uh, services that are being built around Europe, uh, both in design, analytical, but also uh, knowledge, um, we would like to build on that and make it easily accessible through the platform that we are putting together and have it available at the fingertips of uh, the Research Innovation Community of Europe in order to help the process. And uh, uh, we would like to uh, do that and building tools and methods and solutions and we are doing that within the ETIPS networking group five through which we are facilitating this and we are working together with ETIPS net together with bridge experts in supporting this process forward as, a, as I said before this is going to be a sustainable process because 
uh, this is going to be taken on, uh, taken as a responsibility forward by the service contract that the, that uh, that uh, DG Energy is putting forward in order to support and take over and continue this uh, vision forward in support of the research and innovation community in Europe. And our vision, our ERI platform, is already putting together all that I'm describing into real um, a system that is going to go live beginning of April and starting building this and making it available and facilitating this process and gradually continue and reach and serve and offer solutions and means to research and innovation community in Europe. And as you can see here, we have put together a lot of effort in order to make it uh, uh, as rich as possible and as uh, inclusive as possible uh, and as accessible as possible to have this to, uh, open to all research and innovation community. But for the moment, we are talking about smart grids, but it's not going to be limited to that. We are doing an architecture through which it can be expanded to all the energy vectors that are required to, com to complete the energy transition. We are a project of limited time, but as I said, we are putting together a process through which it's going to be sustainable and it's going to be enriched and continuously grow in the years ahead, provided that uh, there is this need appearing and taking up as a, as a need and put forward as a solution for supporting the process. And uh, we would like to indicate that uh, the architecture that we are putting together is going to be constantly growing in data, in information, in knowledge, and make this uh, as a single point of connection uh, throughout Europe and wherever it is this uh, data, information, and knowledge, we are putting the architecture together, we are putting the means and the solutions together in order to have this accessible uh, through the single point of connection, the ERI platform. This doesn't mean that the ERI platform will um, uh, host every bit of information in Europe on its servers, but it will have, if that cannot be uh, made possible, it will have access and it will lead the research and innovation person who is uh, interested to see what is where uh, to be able to access it through the ERI platform. And so for this reason, we are putting a, a quite advanced features of the ERI data model definition through which we can manage all that and we can give the, the, the way of uh, 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 putting it in the repository of this uh, the platform to be made accessible, to be correctly um, uh, uh, arranged in order to be access easily accessible by whoever is uh, would like to use it. And uh, uh, we have made and we have advanced a, a, a repository through which it has a strong search tool through which it can find and can check and it can give back all that is required by the, the person uh, looking for it. And so uh, the ERI platform contains a layout for the search tool. It is composed of the following components the area of selection, projects, organizations, data collections, a quick access to important areas where people are interested in, and advanced search forms for each category, faceted searches, and paginated lists. This is going to be uh, uh, available as from uh, April forward, and we can inform you that we are safely connecting platforms throughout Europe. And we have built a, a, a solutions, we have built applications through which uh, they are making this possible. And we can connect through this uh, uh, for the access to the 
a Drupal data from other systems. Drupal is again an open source uh, uh, capability that is offering this uh, web service application to be functioning. And um, this technology permits access from practically every language and service. It becomes a bridge between different platforms and applications. And Drupal 9, which is the current version of the application, has a way to expose endpoints to manage the Drupal content types and hence accessible to all that is visiting the ERI platform. We are currently working with a number of platforms in Europe and we are constantly discussing with others to bring them on board and have this accessibility. And uh, we are trying to do that through a passport approach, shall we say, through which we make sure that whatever is coming on ERI platform is well documented, is well uh, um, protected, and uh, we have the right for this information to have access to. So that's why we are putting together a process through which we, it will be continuously managed and making sure that what you receive through the platform is a reliable source of information, but at the same time, we are not violating any of the uh, data protection principles that um, uh, exist in Europe. So uh, the process, as we said, is ongoing. We are moving forward with making it available to all, and we are promising that April will be the month through which you will have full access to this, but not everything. We, as we said, this is going to grow over the next years, and it will continuously grow in a direction that can serve you and all the research and innovation community in Europe in the best possible way. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for being part of this interesting webinar of today. Back to you, Mohammed. Thank you all. Thanks for all the participants and thanks for the speakers. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to share my screen and uh, share the questions that we received uh, from Slido. And I will kindly ask the speakers to answer those questions. So, the first question uh, came and I guess it's, it's uh, related to the Pantera platform. How, how will the mission established platforms be integrated, for example, via interface or will the elements be actually transferred to ERI? Yeah, if I can uh, say, I have already mentioned that, but uh, the intention is to have on the ERI platform anything that we are given access to uh, and being allowed to transfer it. But if we are not allowed to transfer it, then we will have agreements in place through which the content will be accessed on the, on the server and within the law uh, regulations of the specific um, association of the specific entity that has the right to that information. Uh, and, um, uh, and if any information is not publicly available because it has restrictions by the owners of the data information or knowledge, then uh, the uh, summary of that or what the content is all about will be made available so that the um, the a person interested will have all that is required and where it is in order to make sure that if it's a, a must to have then to access the right person, the right entity, the right association to get more information about it. Thank you, Vinicius. Uh, going to the next question is to Eric Ritt. Uh, do you see an evolution of uh, uh, virtual access and remote access that can be meet is a potential of more labs as a service, for example, and what could be support digital twin. So I don't know who from uh, Eric Reed team would like uh, to answer this question. Hi, Mohamed. I could say a few words about this. Yes. Um, what I think is, is a very possible way um, of this evolution is that now that we are in a, in a corona pandemic, 
the actual exchange of, of researchers as part of the transnational access part is, is limited. So what I see as a great um, opportunity here is that providing people access to our virtual facilities allows them to get familiar with the tools, let's say, for example, the Mosaic or um, the DPSIM tool we have, and then starting to build up their experiments, their scenarios, and bringing them at a later stage um, to the lab. So to use the virtual access facilities possibly as a way of preparing and, and getting familiar with the tools of a lab before actually visiting it. That's, I think, um, my, my take on that, but maybe somebody else wants to add something. Yeah, maybe yeah. I can uh, also follow up. This is Kai speaking from, I gave the remote access presentation. I think from our lab, we're also looking at the, the merging from the other side. So we have prepared educational tools that help actually as a preparatory element for accessing our laboratory. So some tools that have the same interfaces so that you can prepare your experiments directly against the same in interfaces. Um, so this is not necessarily something we can directly make available as virtual access, but it's certainly something that a remote access preparation could include. Um, so I, I think, yes, that's a really good idea that there's, there's some kind of convergence possible. But mind, mind that is really different to have an access that is um, completely virtualized, it can be only of a, in a form of training, and, and something that is going toward a real ac lab access. There needs to be some collaboration, and that cannot be purely without registration. Um, and I, I think that's, that's sort of the transition point where you say, now I need to involve people from the lab. Um, so th th that's not an automatic transform transformation that's yeah, possible yet with the current organization. Uh, let me add here also, I think it depends on, on the uh, type of the, uh, or the nature of the uh, experiment. So at the end, uh, it could be maybe, but as Kai said, uh, it, dep um, it um, would probably need also some local support. Uh, by a local person. Uh, moreover, uh, the European Commission is going uh, more towards these uh, online services. Uh, you might be aware of the European Open Science Cloud. So that's an initiative that is coming up. Uh, and I think we will see in the future much more of this, uh, these virtual services. I could add uh, one point here because uh, the question also touched uh, the area of a digital twin. I, I briefly um, showcase the uh, virtual facility of NTNU A um, ICCS, where they have this virtual lab they, they use mostly in their educational uh, courses, where they basically try to, to build uh, um, experiments which are very similar, similar to what they have in the, in the physical lab, which is, uh, again, uh, could be a good stage for students to prepare before visiting the lab itself. But in my experience, uh, I think it's it's quite a lot of work to build a, a digital twin of a full lab. I know that I think uh, DTU is, is approaching something similar, what, what Kai mentioned before, that they are trying to build a virtual version of this lab, so to say. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. And I think in, in many areas, we're not there yet to have these fully virtual replicas of, of a physical lab yet. But I think that that would be a nice way to go in general. Okay, thank you. So uh, going to the next question, can a copy of the contract be uh, sent before applying? And I guess this is regarding the virtual, uh, regarding the, the access to the area grid. Uh, um, yeah, transnational access. Yes, Mohammed. Yes, Mohammed. I can take this one. Yes, the, the answer is yes. So, uh, the, the the contract will be included, or a contract model will be included in a in a public deliverable of Ferry Grid uh, that is going to be published in the in the coming weeks. Uh, so, uh, having said that, uh, it's also necessary to emphasize that the contract uh, is something between the host lab and the user group, which means that uh, uh, what is going to be found in this deliverable is just a reference document that, of course, can be modified 
can be changed a little bit or reinforced with some, let's say, additional clauses by the host lab to cover specific individual conditions of, of that organization on even, even country regulations. But uh, in short, the answer is yes. And okay. uh, just to add, we will uh, add that to the uh, website. So you will find that uh, a corresponding link uh, probably in the physical lab access FAQs that are available at the lab access site. Okay, so uh, there's more questions coming, but we are running out of time. So I would kind of ask to um, every great team to answer the last question. And if you, the speaker don't mind, I will kindly ask you, uh, the speakers to answer the rest of the questions and we will follow up uh, with uh, an email with uh, answered questions and also a link for the presentation and the video recording in case you didn't manage to attend the whole uh, webinar. So, uh, so, the Agri, uh, so to the Agri team, uh, is there a specific platform promoted for publishing the project results? Uh, yes, let me answer this question. Um, at the end, we are linking uh, the project results to the project website. In the previous project, the record one, uh, you can find uh, that under the lab access, there's a sub menu called here is access stories as well as the uh, selected user projects. So we will do that uh, in the same manner for Irigrid 2. And the preferred way for Irigrid 2 is also to upload all the reports, not only on the project website, because the project website will disappear after a couple of years. After the end of the project, our new approach is to upload it to the uh, Synodo uh, data repository platform, uh, where we have uh, created a community. So the idea is here to share it via Synodo and link it to the project website. I hope that explains the question. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. So I would kind of ask, uh... Graham to take the final words or closing words for this webinar. Uh, Graham, we cannot hear you. You, you are muted, Graham. Looks like there's uh, some technical problems with Graham's mic. I, we cannot. Okay. Okay. So I would like to thank all. I would, I would take it over and would like to thank all the participants and all the speakers for this interesting webinar. Uh, please keep tuned you know, uh, and uh, we will update you about the link and the slides uh, with uh, all the information about the both project, Pantera project and the Irrigrid project and the virtual access. So we will going to send a dedicated email to all research uh, participants with all the information. Also, I would send uh, a complete answering the, the questions that we didn't manage to answer today. So sorry that we didn't manage to answer all the questions, due time limitation. And I would like to thank you all and please feel free to disconnect. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.